Great. Thank you all for being here tonight. Uh, I'm Danielle Knapp. I'm the Makash Associate Curator here at the JSMA. And I'm one of two associate curators. Um, my colleague Cheryl Hardup is also here tonight, who were the project managers for bringing the exhibition Plastic Entanglements to our museum. Um, if you haven't seen the exhibition upstairs yet, um, just a little bit to know about it. It was organized by the Palmer Museum at Penn State University. And so we were really excited to sign on as a venue to host the exhibition here. And um, we're the only West Coast location for the traveling show. It will go to two other university museums after it leaves Eugene. And we were just really excited about the opportunity to show work by um, 30 artists representing 13 different countries. They're all responding to this global love affair, obsession, crisis with plastic um, in different ways and what that could spark in our community. Um, on and off campus and with these really important discussions of plastics role in our life and our environment. And at the Palmer Museum, one of the programs they organized that they had a really great response to was an interdisciplinary panel talking about the ideas that the exhibition represents, these larger concepts. And so um, we thought you know, that probably would be a really great opportunity for us to have a similar conversation in Eugene. One of the things that Cheryl and I have been so delighted to learn through the process of working on this exhibition is that um, there are so many, and we weren't surprised by this, but now we, we're happy to be working personally with so many people and groups and faculty who are dedicating time and effort and research to this. Um, so that's been really eye-opening and really rewarding for us to work with them, and you'll hear from some of them on our panel um, today. A couple of um, just programming notes. Um, we're, I'm delighted that Babe Sullivan, who I'm standing in front of, um, who is from the Depart Oregon Department of Environmental Quality and Materials Management Program, is our moderator tonight. So thankful for her, for Angie Marzano from Lane County Waste Management, colleagues from Bring and UO Zero Waste, um, all these people that we brought together to help us um, develop, excuse me, develop the idea for this and have been sponsors of the exhibition and this program. And so um, we do have uh, on our schedule next week a student research event um, that was scheduled for Thursday that unfortunately we've canceled. Um, so if you see that listed on our uh, exhibition calendar, that's been canceled, but we're looking at other ways to incorporate student research um, in the gallery itself. So kind of keep your eyes out as you come back to see the exhibition before it closes at the end of December um, for student research to be incorporated into the materials there. And um, also, just one other, a couple other things I'll mention. Um, we have an artist lecture by Matthew Northridge, who's one of the artists on view in plastic entanglements. Um, that's happening on Wednesday, November 28th at 5.30 in the same room. So we hope you'll come back for that. So tonight, um, before we get started with the program, I wanted to mention um, that rather than taking questions directly from the audience on the microphone, we have index cards where you can write down questions during the program. So if you do have a question for the group as a whole um, or an individual speaker, if you kind of just make eye contact with me, I'll be on this side of the room during the program or with Cheryl on that side of the room, um, we'll be happy to pass you a card and a pencil and then we'll collect that from you and we'll be able to incorporate that into the discussion during the um, final half of the program. So just let us know if that's needed. So um, without further ado, I'll go ahead and turn things over to Babe. Thank you so much, all of you, for being here tonight. And thank you all for being a part of this really important conversation. Great. Thanks, Danielle. All right, welcome, everybody. Uh, we've got, I think, a really interesting panel uh, to share some thoughts with you tonight and hopefully provoke some uh, for you to be sharing back with us. So uh, we're going to keep this a really informal discussion, I want to treat it almost like a round table with our panelists. I'll be calling on them with some questions to start the conversation, but we really welcome thoughts or questions from you all as, as we get into the conversation. So please th think about submitting something on one of those cards. I want to start by introducing each of our panelists, and I'm going to ask them to um, participate in a lightning round of introductions <laughs> to share with you in two minutes or less. That's their challenge. Um, how, what work they do and how it connects with some of the themes uh, in the exhibit. So we'll start with, uh, start from the left here, with Stephanie Lemonager. She's with the Department of English and Environmental Studies. Then we've got Emily Scott with the Department of the History of Art and Architecture and Environmental Studies. John DeMarto with Agilit, Agilix Corporation. Um, my colleague, Peter Kanipa, with the Department of Environmental Quality, 
And finally, Dave Tyler with the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry here at the University. So we've got a great panel of uh, different perspectives represented tonight, and we'll be hearing from all of those. So I'm going to start the two uh, the two minute uh, lightning round by calling on I'm going to call I'm going to pick on you, Dave, to go first. Okay. All right. <laughs> Let's see if you can do it in two minutes or less. Oh, I can do it in two minutes or less. Okay, great. So hi everybody. My name is David Tyler. I am a chemistry professor here in the Department of Chemistry and Biochemistry. So why am I here? I'm here because I do research on some of my research is on plastics. And specifically, what we are trying to do is design plastics that after their useful lifetime, they fall apart into harmless, um, non-noxious materials. So for example, more specifically, we are designing polymers that when light shines on them, they degrade. And the scientific challenge here is, how do you design something so that it falls apart after you use it, rather than while you're using it or before you use it? So there's all kinds of interesting scientific questions involved with timing the degradation of a piece of plastic. Excellent. Thank you very much. All right, Peter, just why don't you go line. next? Yeah, let's just go down the line. Cool. Uh, hello, I'm Peter Kanipa. I, as Babe mentioned, work at the Department of Environmental Quality. Um, I am the resident life cycle assessment practitioner. Uh, and that is within DEQ's materials management program. So our whole purview is to focus on the environmental impacts of the stuff we use, um, the stuff we make, the stuff we dispose of. Uh, so it, plastic fits into that bucket, and um, we often do life cycle assessments of plastic. Um, so I will be bringing a perspective, I hope, on the environmental impacts of making, using, and disposing of plastic. Excellent. Thank you. John. Hi. <clears throat> I'm John DeMarto. I'm with Angelix Corporation. Uh, my role at Agilex is feedstock, so I'm working with municipalities and uh, commercial uh, businesses as well as different industries to recycle plastic. And what we do at Agilex is we are uh, able to either take mixed waste plastic or specific plastic and turn that either into a synthetic crude oil or into a chemical that can go directly back into the manufacturing process. Uh, to date, we have sent over 800,000 gallons of mix of crude oil that was made from mixed waste plastic. Uh, currently, right now, we are running a polystyrene process in Tigard, Oregon, where we are running 10 tons per day of polystyrene material. That's everything from expanded polystyrene, uh, rigid polystyrene that you might see in single-use items, even if it has food waste to it, uh, we are taking that and making that into a styrene monomer that then goes right back to a manufacturer that's able to make new materials from that. Excellent. Thank you. I hope some people are already writing some questions based on what John just shared. <laughs> Thank you. All right, Emily. All right. So my name is Emily. Uh, I work on contemporary art and ecology and contemporary art and political ecology. Um, among other reasons I'm interested in art, I'm interested in art because of the ways that it has the capacity to newly sensitize us to the world around us, um, often in ways um, by way of making the kind of familiar less familiar, or the ordinary strange, or the normal kind of less normal, um, and also in helping to kind of envision worlds otherwise. So I think art can be really useful as a tool or a means to uh, question the present, and this exhibition does it really well, I think. Um, I've had a long time interest more specifically in my work in uh, looking at sort of contamination, leakage, toxici toxicity, and ways that various forms of contamination like radioactivity, um, I haven't worked on plastics, but I think this exhibition works on plastics, um, the way that um, various toxins pose representational problems and sort of resist easy representation, and uh, more specifically than that even, I've been really excited about this exhibition because I uh, brought my students. I'm teaching a class on land and environmental art right now. It's my first term at the U UO, and uh, we visited the exhibition and had a wonderful tour, uh, tour of the show from um, Cheryl and Daniela, and my students wrote short paper, response papers to individual work, so it's been great as a teaching tool as well. Great. Thank you. I've got a lapel mic, so. <laughs> um, hi, I'm Stephanie, and I'm in the English department and also environmental studies, as Babe said. And I'm interested in the attachments that 
we human beings have to materials like plastics, like petroleum, and the ways that those materials build out worlds and also potentially destroy them. Um, I've written a book called Living Oil, which was about the ways in which oil culture and the culture of fossil fuels became kind of the, the sort of fundamental note of modernity in the wealthier world um, and the ways in which it becomes necessary uh, and in fact imperative at this point in time to work our way out of that particular story of what I call petro-modernity. Um, I also work on climate fiction and I'm very interested in how um, we can think about the present moment as the past of futures to come. The, t uh, the category speculative futures is a big category in this particular show. And I think it's important to think through um, the kinds of futures that we can postulate from the present that we live in now um, to really try to get to the kinds of futures that we would want. Um, and I think the artists provoke us and challenge us to do that in various ways. Excellent. Thank you. All right. Well, we're going to launch into a period of uh, roundtable discussion with some questions I have. But please, uh, as I said before, um, feel free to capture some <coughs> questions that you have because we'd like to spend some time with your thoughts and questions later in the evening. So I, I'm going to start by picking on you, Stephanie, because you actually spoke directly to the first question I have. But I'm okay. hoping you can expound on it a little bit. Okay. And that is, why do you think plastic is such a powerful symbol of our modern culture? And what does it represent more specifically? That's a great question. I mean, in the uh, 50s, the French um, philosopher and cultural critic Roland Barthes wrote about plastic as a kind of magic material that could become anything. You know, uh, and the idea was, you know, it could be any color, it could be any shape. It was something that would form the world to our whim. And I think there are ways in which we could say that the feminist revolution, for instance, depended in part on the kinds of efficiencies that were built uh, on the basis of Dow Chemical and various kinds of plastic mm -hmm. products that came out of the whole chemical revolution of the middle of the 20th century. Um, there are ways in which even environmentalism, <coughs> you know, I hate to say it, was influenced by the possibilities for um, sort of efficiency that were made possible uh, by the plastics uh, revolution. So plastics is tied to, I think, everything in the culture, both progressive and non-progressive. And it's literally permeated every single aspect of our environment in this current moment, including our own bodies. Um, we can't really get divorced from plastic. Um, but at the same time, I think we need to figure out how to live with it uh, in ways that um, make it possible to continue to have a habitat that is a lively one and one populated by many species that are thriving, not just our own. Um, it, it's, it's a, it is a miracle product, but miracles can sometimes also be curses. Um, there's a great sort of theory uh, in literature that every gift that appears in a narrative is going to necessarily evolve into a poisoned gift. And I feel like plastics has, has been something like that, although we do have some people here representing the possibilities of its futures in ways that uh, perhaps carry more hope. Well, let's turn to Dave for a response to that, because I think you have a little different take from the conversations I've had with you about what plastic represents in our culture now. OK, well, I come from the point of view of a chemist. I'm a chemist. So I look at plastics, and I see an incredible intellectual achievement. We can take plastics. And we can make something that's hard. We can make them hard. We can make them soft. We can make them tough. We can make them not tough. We can give plastics any property that we want, basically. So I look at, and, and that's, that's, that, that wasn't easy to do. There was a lot of science that went into determining how, how we do that with plastics. So just from a purely chemical point of view, an intellectual point of view, uh, maybe a little bit of a nerdy point of view. Um, <laughs> plastics are, I think, th the question was how does it represent our society? Or, yeah, it's a tremendous intellectual achievement. Um, Which has brought with it incredible advances in terms of human hygiene and health and longevity and Right. All those aspects as <laughs> that, well. That's all true. I guess I could go on, or should I, should I pass the microphone? Well, does anybody um, else want to follow up on what you just heard? Emily? Yeah, I mean, 
I, there are a lot of things to say, I suppose. Um, one thing that I think is interesting about the exhibition, a number of my students responded that they felt like it had a kind of dystopian tone, but I had a sort of different reaction that I didn't think it was sort of clearly utopian or dystopian. Mm -hmm. I think it sort of captured the complexity of this kind of substance and our relationship to it in ways that sort of you were alluding to, Stephanie. But in terms of it being um, kind of um, an intellectual achievement, as you put it, David, I think um, one way to think about it is kind of um, the anthropocentric material par excellence. Like it somehow embodies on some level kind of a peak of kind of human achievement or scientific technological achievement. Um, at the same time, you know, one thing about plastic as a material, and um, I'm going to cite someone else here who I think deserves to be cited this evening. She was involved, in, she was one of the curators of the exhibition upstairs, Heather Davis, who is a contemporary scholar and curator who writes very beautifully about plastic. But she sort of writes about it in terms of being the substrate of advanced capitalism mm -hmm. and that it was invented in part precisely to be a material that seals us off from the environment. And so it's sort of fundamental to its properties that it sort of emerges in a way to kind of um, provide a kind of hygienic seal, but that also then maybe it becomes representative of a kind of disassociation or um, detachment that we have from kind of the world around us, other species, et cetera. Um, and so I think that's an interesting kind of point to bring out in, right. in light of what you said. Literally creating a bubble for us, right? Mm -hmm. How about John or Peter, any thoughts on sure. what it represents in our culture? So um, just to kind of expand a bit, again, we're always going back to what David was saying, but to me, in essence, the, the fact that we are taking a organic substance, the hydrocarbons, and we're able to convert those uh, to specific uses, some for life-saving, some for uh, the transportation of food, and, and so forth, and able to use that material in so many different ways, as well as to engineer that for so many different uses, it, it is quite an amazing achievement. And that is really the, the initial innovation of plastic and what we're trying to do at Agilix and what I see as kind of uh, the modern culture for it is now that we have this plastic, now that we have this material that's out there, the biggest thing is to try and figure out how do we reduce use, we uh, try and reuse the material that we have and recycle. And that's really what we're trying to do is in some instances there is no way, as you were saying, to get divorced from plastic. So how can you use that material that's already out there? How can you reuse that? And how can you make sure that you're doing those in, in such ways that you're not creating too much waste? How can you do that uh, uh, working backwards of looking at the material for its specific use, but then also looking at it for its specific reuse and really designing not just for that one use, but the continuous use of those molecules? I'll, I'll just briefly add, I mean, <clears throat> I wrote down, to me, they represent convenience and sort of the, um, I mean, they're almost too good, right, and too mm -hmm. cheap. And so they have become this sort of ubiquitous symbol of human hubris to think we can just make whatever we want and have it on demand and use it once. And um, and that, that because it is this uh, achievement of intellectual excellence that, that that's okay. Um, I mean, you mentioned the start of plastics in the 50s. I mean, the phrase that came to, me, to mind for me was better living through chemistry. Mm -hmm. And that kind of <laughs> sums it up, right? Like mm -hmm. we, you know, we have come to expect this degree of convenience from, from materials. And I think that that sort of symbolizes everything of our modern culture. Mm -hmm. so. Well, Peter, I'm going to pick on you next because I think that picks up on um, a question that I wanted to address to you, and that is first noting that for those of you who have seen the exhibit already, I think many of you might pick up on a rather malignant aspect of plastics. I think that's pretty overt in some of the artwork, mm -hmm. um, particularly that of Chris Jordan, who shows images of birds that have died from ingesting plastic, um, as well as that incredible piece about what's in a camel's stomach. That one was really impressive. Mm -hmm. But Peter, how worried should we be about the long-term impacts of plastic? Well, I, I, 
I guess I would ask a question back oh. um, regarding what impacts we're talking about. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, certainly from an economic standpoint, plastics have produced a positive impact in, <laughs> in a way. Um, and, and then in what terms are we talking about litter, right? You gave the example of the, the were they al albatross? Was that the yeah, one? they were yeah. albatross. Yeah. Um, you know, that litter is a real thing. Um, and it has impacts on on biotic life and um, and on the environment, but but um, other materials do as well, right? And so, as an LCA practitioner, we're always thinking about, well, you know, what are the trade offs between different things, right? If we don't use plastic, well, what's the alternative? Um, and so, I think I, I don't know. Are we talking about impacts as uh, of marine litter? Or are we talking about impacts of producing plastics in terms of greenhouse gas emissions or toxicity? Um, so I would I would want to unpack that a little and 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 maybe be more specific because um, certainly animals ingesting plastic litter is a very visceral, visually s sort of um, haunting thing to see. But but there are many um, fewer impacts in other terms for plastic than other materials. So I, I would I don't know I would I would ask others what impacts are we talking about? Okay, anybody want to pick up the challenge? What impacts are we talking about? Well, I'm sure some other people on the panel can speak much more um, intelligently about this than I can, but of course one of the concerns with plastic is that we don't really know all of the ways, all of the impacts that, that are tied to it. So um, I've been aware of Chris Jordan's work for a long time, and he is one of the artists who's most often sort of cited when it comes to plastics and plastic pollution. And I think while the work is powerful, um, one limit to that work is there's a literalness to it. It's like the plastic that we can see, it's very documentary. Um, so what about all the forms of plastic contamination and the problem of the fact that plastic really doesn't ever go away or not for tens of thousands of years and sort of breaks into smaller parts but doesn't really ever sort of disappear? So what are all of the kind of potential impacts of that, which are much harder to render into a visible form or into representation? So. Yeah, I would, I would go along with that too and say that one of the most interesting pieces in the exhibit, I think, is the um, Pamela Longobardi's Economies of Scale, where she does actually take, it's about the acceleration of plastic production, but she takes us all the way down to the scale of the plastic nurdle um, which is still visible, but you know, if you have to think about that's just one example of a kind of macro microplastic. What about all the other microplastics that we know are entering the bodies of fish and then entering our own bodies? Um, how many particles of plastic are we eating per year if we eat a regular fish diet? I mean, there are lots of questions like that that I think are really hard to answer. And as Emily said so eloquently, they're they're really hard to represent and visualize. So this is a place where art kind of meets up with a, with a potential limit space. Um, but I think the other thing to think about too is just sort of global inequity about where plastics get sent. Um, all of these countries in, in Western Africa and elsewhere um, that are being stuck with the, with the uh, produce of our own um, very vibrant <laughs> consumer culture. Um, there's a terrific piece, and I'm gonna butcher this man's name, but Emmanuel Bacare Dao uh, does a series of photographs called Notre Monde et Ile Durable, is it indeed a sustainable world? And he's showing pictures of young children in West Africa surrounded by e-waste, by the plastic that is part of our you know, computer system, a part of a system that in some ways almost seems immaterial and transparent. So the disappearing of plastics either because of scale, like microscale yeah. plastics you're talking about, or the literal sort of pushing of plastic waste into parts of the world that act almost as sacrifice zones and receptacles for our garbage, our plastic garbage. I mean, I think those are both questions of sort of visibility and invisibility, what can and cannot be seen. And certainly the global inequities are very much on display in the exhibit. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you know, you'll, you'll see that if you haven't already. Mm -hmm. yeah. Dave oh, or John? Yeah, yeah, can I say something? Okay. Yeah, please go ahead. do. No, 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 go ahead. Yeah. So speaking once again as a chemist, um, chemists realize that we've created a problem. But if you're a chemist, one of the things we beat into you, and we do this to all of our students, is that chemists are problem solvers. We've identified the problem. We will solve it. We created the problem for sure. But 
we have to know that there's a problem in order to be able to solve it. It's only, I don't know, in the last, what, 10, 20, 30 years that people say, oh, we have all these problems with plastic. One of the things I love about being a chemist is that we're optimists. This is a problem we will solve. There are, there are scientific solutions to the problem of plastics building up in the environment, fish eating plastic, so on and so on. We will solve that problem. It's, it, it will get solved. Let me ask, did you see anything in the exhibit that speaks to some of the solutions you have in mind? Did you well, see it represented? I only looked through the brochure. I haven't okay. had time to go through. I didn't mean so, to spot. <laughs> so the way we will solve this problem is we will figure out how plastics can degrade into materials that are not noxious. I think, I think that's the way to say it. Okay. Or maybe total recycling, something like that. Okay. Peter, I think you had a response. So, so, no, no, I, I just want to... Uh, so it, it seems that we're sort of arriving at the impact of plastics being predominantly as a litter, as a, a, a debris in the environment, and that, that is an important distinction. And I, um, I would just say in, in the life cycle assessment world, we're always looking holistically at the full suite of environmental impacts that arise when you do or make something. Um, it, and, and so not to discount the, you know, um, the, the potential harms of marine debris, I, just to summarize some from this paper about plastics in the sea, um, business loss, biodiversity loss, transport, transport of invasive species, seabed smothering, habitat loss, harboring of pollutants, species loss. These are all functions, potential impacts of marine debris, but they aren't the same as um, producing greenhouse gas emissions, which affect mm -hmm. climate change. And so, you know, my only sort of disclaimer here is we shouldn't um, have a regrettable trade-off by you know, eliminating plastics at the cost of increasing, say, greenhouse gas emissions. And just as a little anecdote, I don't know if anyone remembers this, but a couple years ago, um, there was a huge die-off of birds, auklets, um, and lot, hundreds of thousands of them, not, and not related to marine debris, but related to a disruption of their food chain because of global warming. So again, um, if what we care about are animals and species and biodiversity loss, we can't ignore other impacts and just focus on litter. Great. Thank I had, you. John, any, any response there? Oh. Were you chirping? I was, but I don't need to chirp. I can. <laughs> uh, no, I, I just wanted to speak to some of what you were saying about the uh, different groups that are being inundated. Um, and really, one of, a, a, as much as it is somewhat detrimental to all of us that want to do the right thing and recycle, it has been a great revelation that everybody understands now that your recycling bin is not a magic uh, a container that can take all these different plastics. People are becoming aware of, okay, I can't just hope that I put it in there. Someone's gonna find an end use. Um, and then kind of to the opposite side, so we have at our facility, we have a public drop box for people to bring in uh, polystyrene material. And it's amazing to see how many people are so adamant that they wanna make sure that that material goes into that bin because they know that that material is then gonna to go to this place to make new things. And, and it's, uh, I mean, so amazing to see, you know, when we had uh, frost and, and, and ice storms the past few years, we'd get to work and there are tire tracks already because someone has already come in that morning to bring material. I, I have everybody from, uh, over in Gresham and further that are driving to our facility because they are adamant that this material needs to be reused. This material cannot end up in our landfills. And kind of moving into to what David was saying is that that, you know, everybody here that is adamant about the plastic problem, this is what's going to move us forward into different types of plastic that can biodegrade to a further recycling of all different plastics and as well, a reduction in, in plastic where it, where it doesn't need to be. Um, so it, it, it is amazing that the impacts that have become so viral uh, with seeing the effects of the beaches and, and the gyres out there have really brought that issue uh, to, to people that probably would have never understood that that was going on. Great. Yeah, go ahead, and then I'd like to move on. I did have a question, um, and if it sort of throws us in a direction that we don't want to go in, we can kind of
kind of walk it back. But this was actually a question to, to Peter. Um, when you were talking, I thought that was you know important point to make that we shouldn't be focusing maybe explicitly on this and not thinking about the impact of greenhouse gases and such. And and I this is a question that really is the question of a of a person who doesn't know the answer. So it's an innocent question. Um, I'll base it on one of the pieces in the exhibit though, uh, just to tie the exhibit in. So there's a piece by Brian um, Jungen called Cut Lines, which is um, a, a fuel a, a sort of um, um, what would you call it, a, like a small fuel tank? Mm -hmm. um, and it's been inscribed by First Nations um, patterning, traditional patterning. And the, the phrase cut lines refers to the lines that are cut through the boreal forest for various kinds of oil and gas exploration. Mm -hmm. So of course, plastics are tied in very much to the fossil fuel system that we see as you know, profoundly impactful in terms of, of climate change in various ways. And I, so I guess for you and for the scientists on the panel, to what degree um, are plastics a kind of efflorescence uh, or material, I don't know, embodiment of the same set of systemic problems that are causing global climate change? Yeah, uh, it's a really good question. I don't know that I have a good answer. I would say, ultimately, yeah, the, the, the primary feedstock for conventional plastics is is crude oil, is fossil fuel. So if it's, you know, um, if it's extracted from the earth in the same way as that crude oil that would be turned into a, into a fuel, it's, it's, it has those same land use implications, those same um, impacts on, on first peoples and on indigenous cultures where these resources are. So um, yeah, they, they are similar. And I, um, yeah, I don't know, do others want to add to that? So um, just to add on that, and I'm glad you brought up that one, because that was a, a piece that kind of hit home to me. Um, one of the things that I, I kind of in, think of when I'm looking at plastic is, you know, all of our communities are generating this waste. And what we are hoping to do is think of that more of a resource. I mean, that... They're, they're right now, we have as much hydrocarbons in the landfills as we do in the U.S. oil reserve. So if we look backwards and we think, why can't we reuse these? Why do we need to continue grabbing more material out of the ground? Then that kind of changes that up. And, and the other side of that, too, is what we're doing is we actually are making a crude oil that has up to 50% less greenhouse gas generation than using virgin products. So again, flipping that uh, around of not having to, to need um, virgin products and reusing what we already have out there, it, it, it takes uh, a lot of the uh, deforestation. It, it, it takes away from uh, uh, additional infrastructure where we already have those resources. And, and that, unfortunately, and th this is the part that many people frown on, it, it is a renewable resource. I mean, we. We haven't divorced from plastic. We're going to be constantly using it. So why don't we think of it as a renewable? Um, I guess <clears throat> I want to push back a little bit. Um, I'm certainly all for and I'm rooting on you know, all of the people who are working to figure out ways to make plastic both less noxious, sort of chemically, and also to think about kind of using plastic in more responsible ways or assessing its sort of potential impacts relative to other um, kinds of materials. Um, but I, I think that it's really, you know, I think it's important that we also are um, critical about or question to some extent the, the approach of a kind, a kind of techno-fix approach as being in itself like fully adequate to, to deal with the problem or s condition of plastic in a plast ever more kind of plasticized world. And I think the kind of technological approach is very common, and I think another common approach is the kind of consumer fix problem, which is that if we kind of make different market-based decisions about the products we use, that that will kind of um, address the problem or make us feel better. Um, I don't know how many of you went to the talk by Diana Cohen, which was very well attended. She's one of the artists in the show. When you first walk in, it's the first piece with the bag that's sewn together a sculpture out of plastic bags. And she's basically been an artist for many, many years working with plastic bags who's, um, you know, transformed into a pretty full-time activist who works on sort of 
you know, plastic reduction. Um, and so, but I felt like at her talk, it was really, really good, but I felt like in her talk too, unintentionally, she slipped often into that kind of mode of encouraging us to sort of um, limit our use of single-use plastics, et cetera, so brought it down to a kind of consumer level. And I think it, it is, while all of these kinds of approaches are important, kind of making sure that we think about larger kind of structural questions is also important about what kinds of worldviews, what kinds of ideologies sort of led to the emergence of plastic mm -hmm. and to this kind of, to its pervasiveness and to this sense that we have now that it's sort of inevitable, that we will always have it, that we can't get rid of it. I know we can't get rid of what's already there, but um, I take a lot of value in, in sort of work that, that pushes back and says, well, do we have to think about it as a kind of natural f matter of fact today? Or is it possible to imagine a world without plastic? What would that look like? So I just wanted to push back a little bit. Um, and that's the humanist and art, sort of arts and humanist person. Um, I'm marking myself as one of those. <laughs> <laughs> no, I really appreciate that. In fact, you're anticipating some of the questions I have. But I want to turn to one, Emily, for you. Um, because you've raised this theme about consumer plastics and the consumer experience of plastic and why that has become a real focus for a lot of um, advocacy and environmental concern. So consumer plastics have become this important focus with um, mobilizing many communities to ban plastic bags, um, to consider regulating plastic straws and other single-use plastic consumer items. We know that there's a lot of other use of plastic in our society, but I'm really curious about why these consumer plastics have taken, um, taken hold of the imagination in the way they have. Why do you think this resonates so much with the, pl with the public? And is this a gateway to a broader conversation about the challenges of our consumer si society, or is it a, de a dead end talking about consumer plastics? Um, I'll just speak briefly, because I bet all, all of us have something to say about that. But, um, I think it represents, um, in some ways, it's, it makes us feel better if we feel like we can do something actionable and concrete and kind of material to make a change. Um, but it also represents the kind of um, being trapped within a consumerist logic and a kind of petro-capitalist logic mm -hmm. that um, isn't really important. Again, I, that's why I feel like you know to, to keep in mind and move between these different scales is really important of kind of like, immediate kind of solutions, different types of solutions, different scales of solutions. Um, I really appreciated the points you brought up earlier, Stephanie, too, about this kind of out of sight, out of mind. There's something about plastic itself, this kind of fleeting relationship we have to the material, the way it enters our lives and leaves our lives, and we're not forced to sort of think about where it comes from, where it's going, how long it's going to exist, and so um, to kind of shift us out of that kind of mindset, I'm worried that if the, the answer we're getting is that if we, you know, buy steel, which I do this myself, like I buy, you know, steel, you know, objects for my kids to take their lunch to school in because I'm less worried about it. And they had glass baby bottles as, as opposed to plastic. So I do it too, but I also think, you know, it's important for us to move far beyond those kinds of questions. And your points about thinking about the larger kind of entanglement of plastic with other questions or other environmental factors is absolutely essential. Peter, do you want to pick up on that discussion about consumer plastics and why they seem to have grabbed so much attention? Uh, yeah, I mean, I think you hit the nail on the head. It, it, it's, you know, we are touching these things every day. Um, we see them uh, walking down the street as litter often. Um, so there's a sort of a visual connection to it. I think someone else mentioned that already. and. Um, I, what I'm afraid, and so I think that's why it resonates with the public, but, but I, I don't know, maybe the skeptic in me is afraid that that will be, that, that will be it, right? We'll ban plastic straws, everyone will, you know, pat themselves on the back and we'll go home and feel great about, you know, being granolier than thou, and yet, <laughs> you know, the, the magnitude of plastic consumption associated with straws is probably a fraction of um, a hundredth of a percent, I don't know, of total plastics consumption globally. So I would just hate for us to stop there. That would seem seem insufficient. So. 
how do we make it a gateway discussion? Thoughts about how to take that concern and engage in a broader conversation about what's going on with our consumer society? Well, I think it, it certainly does become a gateway discussion in teaching. I mean, I do a, a, an assignment where I have students trace their favorite consumer item as best they can through its life cycle. So we're certainly not doing anything to the degree of sophistication that you do. But, and it's always really surprising to see where they get stopped sometimes. Uh, you know, they'll have to call producers, they'll call companies, and they'll be told something is proprietary, and then they can't go any farther with their investigation. But what they learn is a lot about these larger structural or systemic problems that I think sometimes are completely occluded from the view of a typical person. Um, and there are also things that we tend to feel, if we don't know about them already, we can't act within or against in any way. And I should say that I am the person who said we can't get divorced from plastics, and I did mean the ones that already exist in the system. I do think we can get divorced from fossil fuels, and I think we have to. And I think this is actually a related problem. None of this is easy. Just as divorce isn't easy, by the way, <laughs> but <laughs> someone who knows that as well. But you know, I mean, it's absolutely necessary to have um, experiments with utopianist thinking, with uh, DIY small-scale uh, living experiments, where we are not actually dependent upon what uh, one artist, Brett Bloom, has called a kind of petro-subjectivity, a literally a human subjectivity that is sustained by petroleum, and I think the plastics complex is part of that petro-subjective way of thinking that we as humans are, are actually um, not able to function without the prosthetics that, that plastic as a miracle material has brought to us. So, um, so I think you know, various kinds of systems uh, analysis that can be done both through history, uh, literary studies, uh, the study of narrative, and, and the, the sciences are a really important gateway um, to understanding larger structures and systems. Dave, I'm going to put you on the spot for a minute to share okay. a, a story that you, um, you talked with me about on the phone, uh, giving me an example of a conversation you had with a student about the scale of solutions in this space around plastics. Would you mind sharing that with the audience? Sure. So it was a, at the beginning of the school year, academic year, a student came into my office and wanted me to sign a petition to ban the sale of plastic water bottles on campus. She was a very nice student. We started talking. And it came out during the course of the conversation that she had just gotten back from a family vacation to Greece. So she lived in Portland. She and her family had flown from Portland to Athens and had a good time. Obviously, they came back. And so that <laughs> gave me an opening. <laughs> so we, the numbers are out there, as, as Peter could tell us. Um, it's not exactly what the how much fuel is required to fly from Portland to Greece and how many bottles you can make from a gallon of petroleum, that kind of thing. So it turns out that uh, something, like, something like 10 million bottles could be made from, from the amount of petroleum that, that, that the jetliner burned flying from Portland to Greece. And the total number of bottles used by the U of O, if every student bought the typical number of bottles that the average American buys in a year, was half that much. So I said to her, you came to me and you want me to sign this petition because you're concerned about using petroleum. You know, it's, a, it's not a renewable resource. And yet your family vacation, the, the airplane that you used, you could make twice as many bottles as are used on the U of O campus in a year. And, and I doubt the U of O, typical U of O student buys two or 300 plastic bottles a year, but maybe. And so, so I think I made a point with her, like, oh, she'd never thought of that. So, yeah, just it, it, was, it was a bigger picture type argument that mm -hmm. I made. Right, mm -hmm. right. And I think it was a really interesting illustration about how we as consumers have these blinders on around the impacts of our choices, right? And so it's, it is very easy to focus on the tangible, what's right in front of us to see that plastic bag blowing in the wind and getting caught on the tree and, and worrying about that when we don't attend to our own choices around things like driving and air travel and much more impactful choices in our lives with regard to fossil fuels. So I think that it helps to put in perspective what the scale of solutions could be in, in the future. Let me say one more thing, comment on what Emily said is that I mentioned that chemists are problem solvers and the 
we have to identify the problem first. So what you've asked for is really interesting. A material that is not a plastic, that has none of the, say, the bad properties of plastic. And that's a problem. And I mean, the chemists, somebody will write a proposal, a grant proposal on that someday, and we'll tackle that problem. Uh, it, it's just good to, to know the problem. And you, you've identified <laughs> one. That's really great. John, any thoughts? I know you haven't, you're, you're sitting in the middle, but I haven't <laughs> picked on you for a no, while. No, 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 that's good. And, and just expanding on what David was saying is, you know, if we look at our choices, so you were saying, Emily, uh, of using the, the metal and using the glass, and a lot of that I'm, I'm guessing is is the inertness of that and also the, the uh, ability to recycle those materials afterwards. And if we look at the problem of we need to design these materials for its use as well as for its end of life, for its reuse, um, that then potentially, as, as David was saying, we can design those materials to be inert. We, we can make these materials so that they are reused afterwards. And again, going back to it, we don't have to use fossil fuels for this. We, mm -hmm. we already have enough that's out there. A and if we go back to, uh, uh, just harpening on it again, uh, of the fact that there is this material, we have already produced it, so we can definitely use that as that resource and see what we can do from there. Right. I'm going to suggest we move on. We have a few more questions, and then I'm going to welcome questions from the audience. Um, and this has come up. I think, Emily, you spoke to this a little bit, but I'm, I'm eager to hear from all of you about what the future might look like with or without plastics. Are plastics here to stay? Can we imagine a future with plastics? How about a future without them? And um, actually, Dave, I'm going to call on you first with, with that question. At this point, it's hard for me to imagine a future without plastics. But what I imagine for the future is plastics that are degradable into totally non-noxious products, materials. When you say that, tell us more. What what are those materials that it well, would degrade to? Plastics are based on hydrocarbons, carbon, hydrogen, maybe a little bit of nitrogen, that type of thing. So the degradation would be carbon dioxide, or the degradation products would be carbon dioxide and water, They're just mm -hmm. the typical products of organic degradation. Mm -hmm. So if we can design plastics that degrade into those materials, which are, which are relatively <laughs> harmless, not in the greenhouse gas sense, but relatively harmless to humans, mm -hmm. uh, I can imagine that future very easily. Mm -hmm. This is a problem that chemists are working on. Peter, thoughts on that? Sure. Um, yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't think that I can imagine currently a future without plastics. Um, I think, though, it's important to distinguish between um, the different uses of plastics in the future, and maybe that's where the discussion should be. Like, mm -hmm. do we need plastics, uh, single-use plastic packaging, um, versus you know plastics in in the building uh, built environment, which mm -hmm. persist for 35, 70 years, versus mm -hmm. on average single-use plastics, which are in use for six months. Um, those seem like very different applications of the material, and I, I so the latter, the 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 built environment, um, textiles, cars, I, uh, healthcare, mm -hmm. you know, these longer uh, duration uses, I, I feel like they are these amazing materials with these, we've heard about their properties. I, I can't for, foresee us eliminating them completely. Mm -hmm. okay, Should we just go down the line, Sean? Thoughts sure, on that? I, I guess so. Uh, so my future vision for plastics is that we are able to reuse, if not continuously reuse these plastics. And we think of these waste sheds, whether it's the gyres, whether it's the landfills, as potential resources for us. And that's one thing that we really haven't touched upon is the groups that you know are, are working to get those materials out of the ocean. There has to be something that we can do with that. We can't just throw our hands up and say, that's now a, a, a waste that we're going to put somewhere else. We need to take care of the problem that's out there, and we need to reuse that in whatever we, we deem is the, the best uh, use. And also kind of what Peter has been talking about is really look at the items that we're using and identify the uh, complete life cycle analysis. So 
is it something that uh, I'm using here? I, I, is it the best product to be used in this instance? And is it the best product to be reused after that instance? And, and really look at not just bringing that product to the market, but also its use afterwards and the energy consumption, the uh, resources that are, are needed to use that, to reuse that, and uh, try and figure out a way that we can uh, look at all the materials that are out there in, in, in a different way. And then here's Stephanie, thoughts on that? I like that last thing you said about imagining materials in an entirely different way. And like, um, but I, I, I'm not gonna answer my own perspective on that necessarily. I also find it very difficult to imagine a future with humans and without plastic. I wish I could see it better. But um, I think one part of the exhibition that's really compelling is the last part as it's kind of, it's not really chronological, but the speculative futures where mm -hmm. several artists sort of um, create compositions or figurations of a kind of hybrid world. And it's not clear if it's fantastical or monstrous. It's mm -hmm. sort of left open as a question, mm -hmm. which is a kind of world in which there is a kind of merging of sort of the human and the plastic. So I'm thinking of these kinds of sculptures by Christine uh, Vertheim from the Institute for Figuring toward uh, the end where she even titles the work the Cthulhu scene, which is a term Donna Haraway, the feminist scholar, has kind of proposed as the moment we live in, mm -hmm. which is sort of a moment where it is this sort of, there aren't clear distinctions between the kind of human and non-human, but there are these kind of cyborgian kind of figures that emerge out of it that are non-binary and kind of, um, we don't really know what they are exactly. Mm -hmm. They sort of don't fit obvious or pre-existing categories very easily. So I think there are some interesting works towards the end that kind of speak to that. Um, and um, Pinar Yoldis's work about, she kind of imagines these biological specimens that might evolve out of the plastic sea in these kind of, um, they're not test tubes, but these kinds of glass cases. So, yeah. And I, I would kind of do the similar move to what Emily's doing. I mean, I, uh, thought that the Plastic Glomerate series was quite interesting, and it's these sort of fused rocks where you have beach debris, including plastics and sand that, with un, in the, un, under the influence of heat, fuses into these rock-like um, formations called Plastic Glomerate by the artist Kelly Jasvac. Um, I see plastic in the future as the future's past. And I see a plastic agglomerate layer uh, in the geological strata of the planet that some future humans look back upon and they say, at one point in time, mm -hmm. life and non-life in the form of plastic lived together, intermingled, and existed. And we called this moment the Anthropocene for a very short period of time until we realized that humans are actually not central. <laughs> so that's my vision. Yeah, wonderful. All right, well, the last question I'll pose before we turn to the audience is, you know, we've heard some different ideas about what that future might look like. How do we begin to construct that future now with what we're doing? Maybe I'll turn to the problem solver first. <laughs> Dave, any thoughts for what we can be doing now to construct that future? <laughs> I can only answer my, in my world. Yeah. But in my world, it takes money and it takes research. Um, so probably federal dollars, mm -hmm. graduate students, motivated people. Can I ask as a follow-up question, um, the, the notion of um, the precautionary principle uh, to guide that research and to guide pr um, the development of new materials, is that something that um, is actively applied in your field? Or is that something that, that we would need to be thinking about separately? Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. So amongst chemists in the pharmaceutical field, medicinal chemistry, it is applied, of course. Not so much in the plastics field now. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else want to go next? It looks like Peter's ready. Go ahead. All right, I'm going to veer way off here on this. <laughs> go for it. But, um, yeah, so I think plastics to me represent sort of a symptom of the broader broader perversity of our prevailing organizing system, which is yeah. um, 
short-term economic gains at all cost. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, to me, envisioning the future where, you know, it's not about um, the next three months uh, and shareholders mm -hmm. represents a vast shift in how we evaluate the well-being of uh, all life on Earth, mm -hmm. including humans. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm going to steal a quote to end uh, yeah. from a speech Robert F. Kennedy gave in 1968 mm -hmm. about how perverse GN, uh, GDP, GNP is as a metric of, of well-being. Mm -hmm. So uh, he said, yet the gross national product does not allow for the health of our children, the quality of their education, or the joy of their play. It does not include the beauty of our poetry or the strength of our marriages, the intelligence of our public debate, or the integrity of our public officials. Um, <laughs> it measures neither wit nor courage, neither wisdom nor our learning, neither our compassion nor our devotion to our country. It measures everything in short, except that which makes life worthwhile. Mm -hmm. So I think that sort of, to me, summarizes why we're stuck in this sort of inertia. All right, but other thoughts? How do we build that future, Stephanie? I think one of the things that I love about art, and I'm kind of a naive, I'm not an art historian like Emily is, but is that anything can happen in art. Uh, it's not politics. It's not uh, our federal government. It's not, you know, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a space of all kinds of possibility and imagining. And years and years ago when um, Amory Lovins and others were thinking about trying to shift to a different energy system. Uh, I think it was Levins himself who said, you know, there should be no limit to imagining. Um, actually, just sitting on this panel today, hearing what you all have to say, talking with people in fields that I don't normally get to talk to, even at this very interdisciplinary university, uh, I find it very heartening. Um, and I hope that we can start as a, as a people, uh, I think in the national frame, but this is also a global problem, of course, to really ask the kinds of ethical questions that say Emily posited earlier on and then have our chemists specifically working to answer those ethical questions in terms of what they produce. Um, I still think that's possible, but I wonder how much damage has to be done to get to a point where something like long-term thinking uh, occurs and long-term planning occurs uh, at a governmental level, either nationally or internationally. Um, but that's what I'd like to see. I'd like to see ethically informed science. I'd like to see science informed by indigenous cosmologies, by people who've lived and, and worked in place productively and ecologically for many, many, many uh, millennia. You know, let's, let's see a world in which we really change the story of modernity. Uh, and let's not wait until you know, we have a massive die-off of populations of humans and non-humans to do it. We're almost at that tipping point. John or em Emily, any final thoughts on that question? I'm, I'm glad that this issue of time and temporality somehow has come up a couple, in a couple of the closing comments already because um, I do think, I mean, I think politics are hugely important, <laughs> but I also think that, um, you know, the, the, the extent to which sort of the way that our daily lives and our sort of um, cycles of news and politics work, it's so easy to remain kind of trapped within a very human-centric kind of frame and one that's very much situated in terms of kind of the next three months or the next five years. And so I think one solution, it's very broad, or one idea would be, you know, how can we figure out ways through our teaching maybe, through conversations like this, through exhibitions, through, you know, all sorts of ways, um, maybe through science as well, um, to make it far less easy and comfortable to live kind of in a way where we don't have to think very carefully about kind of our material interactions and about our interactions with kind of, um, you know, the world beyond only the human world um, or beyond kind of like the U US context, for instance, to think about sort of other places where our refuse is sent off to. So how do we this comes back to a really basic point about sort of instilling kind of um, tools for critical thinking and reimagining and questioning, which you know, I keep coming back to. And I, I, again, I think art is, can be really helpful at kind of shaking us out of um, our comfort zone of sort of looking at what already is existent to kind of question it or imagine otherwise, so. Excellent. John, last comments before Great. we turn to the audience. So uh, just expanding uh, again on what you guys were saying, 
the exhibits that are up there, I, I think really drives home that idea that really there are no free lunches in, in the natural world. You know, there are always going to be consequences for the choices that we make. And, and moving forward, we need to be able to understand the consequences for the different uh, uh, ways that we live, the different products that we're purchasing. And, and really, if we have a full understanding of we're going to move to this item because this is exactly what it's going to do and this is what it's going to be in the end, uh, rather than kind of the knee-jerk reactions that we have in let's move to this material because I think it might be a little bit better. Let's uh, um, move away from this practice because it might be better. In, in truly understanding um, what the consequences are in, in what we're doing, and really, the, the future of this all is, is something exciting. I, I mean, every day I'm coming to work and we are uh, identifying new plastic waste. We are identifying how we can put this into our process and we can f uh, work to find where that outlet is going to be. You know, we are, are working with these companies that want to reuse these products. We are working with the companies that want to make the products, but we'll only will make that product as long as it is certified recyclable. So that is the future uh, of it, is understanding through uh, you know, all the different uh, audiences, whether that's the producers, whether that's the consumers, or, or, or the waste haulers, uh, what their impacts are, and truly working to have uh, at least everybody agree upon these are the consequences for our action. Is that something that we are accepting, or do we need to do something different? Thank you all. Well, I've got a number of questions that have been submitted by the audience. We probably don't have time to get through all of them, but I'll, I'll pick a couple of representative ones. Um, I think this is an interesting question. It, it plays off a couple of comments that you all just made about uh, the ethics um, of what this future use of plastics might look like and what kind of responsibilities we have today. So this question is, do you think it feasible to require manufacturers to take responsibility for the plastic waste they produce. So for example, the Coca-Cola company producing Coke in, bottle, in plastic bottles. Is it feasible to require them to take responsibility for it? Thoughts? Uh, it, it should be their responsibility, right? I mean, that's, uh, again, to my whole comment about the, the prevailing economic system. You know, there's no, there's no responsibility to ensure your product um, meets any thresholds of planetary boundaries. You can put any product on the market, and as long as it's profitable, then then you've succeeded, and that's mm -hmm. clearly um, ignores a lot of the externalities. So. Mm -hmm. Any other thoughts on that question from folks? Yeah, yeah go oh, ahead. Sorry, I, I agree, and I think that they are, and I think the, the other part that's missing from that is not the... Uh, it, 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 uh, product responsibility, but also uh, creating the mechanism to getting those products into the right bucket for reuse or, or recycling. I, I think that's one of the parts that is missing is it's great that you can uh, put out there that that is a product that can be recycled, but what are you actively doing? Companies that are, are putting this out there, what, what are you doing to make sure that that isn't going to end up in a place that you don't want? And, and I think that's easily easily done. And, and the hard part with some of this, you know, talking with some of these manufacturers is it does scare them when there are these bans that come out because then it forces them to say, well, do we really want to uh, do this work if we feel that, you know, groups are going to ban this product? And so really, instead of thinking about the bans as a mechanism to have waste reduction, push onto those groups that you need to have that end of life solution tied into the products that you're putting out there. A related question, because I think it touches on some of what you just said, John. How do you think we can wean our culture of the wasteful use of this material? So lots of, lots of parts to that question. First, how do we wean our culture? That's a big question. <laughs> um, <laughs> And, and thinking about, pla about plastic as disposable, something that's easily wasted, um, how, do, how do we turn the ship on that? 
Anybody want to switch? John, you're the expert. <laughs> this may seem really impractical. It's not a very practical answer to the question, but I mean, <clears throat> I think history is important because it's not that we've always interacted with plastic. There was a world before plastic. <laughs> and it's important that we don't forget about that and sort of look not only to the past, but as you, you know, others have mentioned, sort of different cultures, different cosmologies in which plastic, I mean, it's so recently become kind of entangled to the point where we can't unimagine it hardly. Mm -hmm. Like it's not that many decades in fact. So um, back to your point about the kind of rapid pace of our kind of thinking, um, I think there are ways to kind of um, jog memory or to kind of um, create other reference points that help us sort of wean ourselves out of certain sort of very um, sort of toxic and damaging and um, you know, impactful sort of practices, which are now extremely widespread. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would also say that I think there's a lot of work that each and every one of us and then communities more broadly can and, and I hope are doing to, to really shift our own sense of what we need and, and, and how we want to intervene to, to kind of decide how we want to intervene in these, these global systems. But I, I mean, the responsibility is not all on us. That you know, I really think the responsibility exists on the production end. It exists with our governments, which have to have a spine and enforce regulations. Even when we have regulatory bodies, oftentimes they cannot enforce regulation. So I mean, I, I think that we also we ought to really get. You know, I'm, I suspect I'm talking to people who already feel this way. I'm mad at the systems that imbricate me in ways that I actually cannot really resist in, in every respect. Mm -hmm. And, and I, I do feel like you know, too much self-blame actually just feeds into uh, the deregulated mm -hmm. environment which has allowed corporations and with the help of our government to, to, just, to just follow the profit motive, to worry about the stakeholders, to worry about endless growth. Um, it's it's going to be a really big project to turn that around. Mm -hmm. I don't know how it's going to happen without, frankly, some sort of a disaster. And even disaster seems to be profitable. But you know, mm -hmm. but the systems themselves force and an kind of entanglements and embeddedness that um, you know no individual is entirely able to escape. And and this is something that really makes me mad. And that I think we all you know can be cognizant of, not to forgive ourselves, uh, but just to sort of say, this is very big, this problem. Mm -hmm. um, so wastefulness is, you know, it's not, a, it's not a puritanical individual crisis so much as a, a systemic crisis of global capitalism that has made all of this seem inevitable. And, and we are entering sort of new and extremely dark phases yes. of this moment. If right. I was just reading in the last few days about sort of in Brazil, there's now a proposal um, to merge the Department of Energy with the Department of Agriculture as a means to basically dismantle kind of any form of environmental kind of oversight or regulation. And we know the kind of, you know, in the last several years, the kind of extreme sort of restrictions and limitation um, that have been placed on the EPA to do anything right. effective. So things are being kind of dismantled by way of very toxic entanglements between big business and government, which I think like those are also, so it's partly this, you know, putting kind of more onus on manufacturers, but it's a much larger problem than that. Like mm -hmm. what kind of policies would need to be in place to force companies to sort of be responsible for their products in a kind of, um, over the life cycle of those materials. I mean, that would be an enormous project. Right, right. Mm -hmm. restructuring. Other thoughts, Peter? I, I just want to give a shameless plug for Babe, who's working on the state of Oregon's sustainable consumption strategy right now, which Yay. is all about trying to come up with what that looks like. Okay. Yeah, yeah. I have the enviable task of trying to figure out how to reconstruct our consumer society. <laughs> <laughs> so you should have been talking the whole time. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> we, we need to talk to you for That's another hour. <laughs> I'd love your answers on this one. Um, and happy to chat with anybody afterward. We only have a few minutes left. I want to address one more question to the, the panelists and then um, we'll wrap things up. This one was interesting to think about. How do the world's youth play a role in the future relationships with society and plastics? 
what can young people do to help build a sustainable future? So is there, is there a specific or particular opportunity for young people here? Yeah, John. Okay, so uh, going back to what David said, I, I, I am an a optimist. I, I'm a cheerleader at heart and also in practice. Um, and I have five-month-old twin babies. And I want to leave them in a world where this idea of having areas in the ocean where plastic just is kind of floating around is something that they only read about. I, I want to leave them in a world where uh, potential resources are not just put in some landfill where they're never going to be used again. Uh, I, I want to leave them where they can walk around in nature and they're not seeing different containers, different wrappers. And really, a lot of that goes back to exactly what we're all angry about. We're angry that the current waste system is broken. You know, whether that's what you put in your, your land or your, your uh, uh, trash to your recycling, we need to rethink what's going on there and, and always going back to let's not make that brash decision uh, of going one way or another just because, well, this option wasn't working, so let's flop over to this. Understanding that life cycle analysis is, is, is something that we're always coming back to, but knowing that there is a way forward. There is the resources that are already there that we can reuse. We don't need to depend on pulling out more resources. We can reuse that, whether that's energy or, or different materials, and we can make a world where this issue is, is something that you know we have to, similar to the rotary phone, we have to explain how, you, how, tape, how tapes work. Even now, CDs, how, how does that work? And I hope that in our work, whether that's in plastics that biodegrade, whether that's in the reuse of plastics, that that can then push forward different opportunities for the youth. Uh, um, as we have so much uh, energy, uh, we have from our company alone, we, I've, I've gone to so many different schools and they are just uh, uh, crestfallen in the fact that they can't do the recycling that they've learned about. They, they can't put the materials in these bins because they know it's gonna go there. And so now having these resources to do that and having them be able to say, that box goes there, that material goes to that place, and then that goes there and not have it as just some mystery thing that it just floats out into the ether and somehow comes back to us and really understanding and, and having that as now their life story uh, moving forward is reuse and recycle, and first of all, reduction. Any other thoughts? I'll just be the cantankerous old guy. Um, <laughs> like, get out there, get off social media, get into the world, uh, put down your phone, and vote. Yeah, <laughs> very nice, very nice. I just want to say I yeah. think youth are actually yeah, and run for office. But I also think youth are at the, at the forefront of the climate movement and deserve a big shout out for that. And that fight needs to go on with all of our support and support for affordable education and support for reducing student debt loads. So, Yeah, we're at yeah. ground zero of that fight right here in Eugene. We are. With, with an important case going forward, so, or hopefully going forward. Well, I hope you'll all join me in thanking our panelists for a really lively, interesting conversation. And I think everybody's here for a few minutes. If you have any specific questions you want to address to one of our panelists, feel free to come up. Thank you. And thank you, Babe, as well, and all the panelists on behalf of the museum for for what you provided tonight. As a reminder too, the galleries are open until eight tonight, so if you haven't seen the exhibition yet or if you wanna see it with new eyes, having learned some um, really valuable information tonight, please make sure you go up and enjoy the exhibition. And we have um, surveys about the Plastic Entanglement Show and a pledge about um, ditching the disposables, even though we know that's just a baby step overall. Um, if you fill out that survey and that pledge and turn it in at our front desk, um, you can get a stainless steel straw. So um, please take advantage of that if you haven't done so. So yeah, thank you so much.